prayed with she and that lady who had visited this church. She brought the lady to me. We stood there and led that young lady to the Lord. She accepted Christ. And I told her, I said, you know, I said, if, if God is your father and he is my father, what does that make you and I? She said, family. And I said, that's right. And I said, you know, would you do me something? Today is your spiritual birthday. So I said, my son-in-law gave me this new Bible, and he told me to use it however I wanted to. I said, would you write your spiritual birthday down in the back of my Bible? So there it is, son. <laughs> Anybody else have something you want to share? I don't want to uh, quench your good, a good testimony. Okay, thank you. A great song to sing after that. All to us. Let's stand together and sing. Precious cornerstone, sure.
Tonight we round out our study of the book of James. It's certainly been uh, an exciting journey for me to go through the book. Next Sunday night I start a new sermon series um, entitled God Encounters, which in some ways may be the best thing for you to do. I mean, I want you to encourage you to go to all the community groups and all the places, but, you know, if you have my Wednesday night and my Sunday night kind of put together, um, It might be an interesting combination. Starting next week, um, I go through a series called God Encounters where we look at primarily the Old Testament examples where God encounters people, Um, whether it's Noah or a Moses or a Samuel, and God speaks and demands a response. A lot of famous passages that we'll be going through And so that starts actually next week. But tonight we round out our series on the book of James. And really, James ends with the appropriate resolution of where James begins. James begins his book by saying, Blessed is the man who is able to rejoice in trials. And yet the book, tosses that theme around, and the end of this chapter addresses suffering and sickness, and yet James says one of the most needed things to keep our faith up and running when things are breaking down is effective prayer. And this is going to be, uh, and really tonight, uh, James chapter 5 verses 13 through the end of the, to the end of the book. James in rapid succession is going to give us principles on prayer, principles for our personal life in prayer, principles for uh, church leadership in regards to prayer. And then James is going to do things that we don't expect him to do, like connect prayer and physical healing and confession of sin. And he'll do it all right in a row, and you'll think, well, what did, they, what did those things have to do with one another? Well, we'll see he's going to wrap them all together. Uh, he's also going to wrap together tonight, as I, as I preview the text for you, uh, he's going to wrap together talking to God, and guess what? Talking to men. By the way, an effective prayer life to God oftentimes brings about an appropriate confessional life to men, as James will wrap all of this together in one big package, tie a nice bow on top of it, and tonight we're going to address the issue of effective prayer. What does it take to be effective in this area? If your prayer life is poor, your Christian life is poor, You just won't make it. And James will make that point tonight. So he warms us up. There's going to be four main points tonight, but he starts out by giving us some principles for our personal prayer life. He's going to move in different directions, but he just starts out with a basic principle for our personal prayer life. The first point today is we should know the place of prayer and praise, James will make um, uh, make plain here, in our personal prayer life. Prayer and praise. By the way, prayer is not always a somber experience. Actually, I think an appropriate personal prayer life 
is that of rejoicing and that of lamenting. I mean, you read the Psalms, uh, and they're both in there, aren't they? Um, Actually, I'll tip my hand again. I'm just tipping my hand all over the place tonight. My next sermon series is going to be in the what is called the Hallelujah Psalms, leading up to Thanksgiving. And they are certainly psalms of praise, okay? But they're also psalms that are, God, how long, O oh Lord? Are you going to keep us in this mess? Uh, can't you do something about it? So they're both in there. Let's look how James talks to us about our personal prayer life. Verse 13, James says, Is any among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Now notice verse 13. James is not talking about us doing corporate prayer at this context. He's not even telling us to pray with one another in this context. He's addressing head-on the issue of prayer in our personal life. Now notice, um, James says, Is any among you suffering? The issue of trials that James has brought up. How do we endure trials? Well, most of the time, the natural impulse to suffering is, by the way, at least maybe it's your natural impulse, but certainly not my natural impulse, is not to pray. Right? You suffer and you do what? You complain. I mean, that's why, well, you know, what is going on? I'm trying to figure it out, right? I mean, that's the natural, at least my, I mean, maybe you're more spiritual than I am, but when I'm having a bad day, the last thing I want to do nine times out of ten is pray. And James says, all right, we want to keep our faith up and running, he says, if you're suffering, pray. It's a very important step. Because if you're suffering, by the way, suffering is the number one reason people are agnostic or atheist. Did you know that? Number one reason. You ask someone who's agnostic or, agnostic or atheist, suffering is always the number one reason. Historically, it's been that. And James says, in the throes of the crisis, pray. You know, we have, you know, the whole Bible here. And James obviously loves the Old Testament because he quotes from the Old Testament constantly or alludes to it constantly in the book of James. And you have whole books, one book written by Jeremiah called Lamentations. Jeremiah knew how to pray in suffering, didn't he? He learned it in his personal life. And so James says, if anyone is suffering, pray. Don't complain. Don't try to sort it out. Just pray. And you do it. Yourself. By yourself. It's important. But he says, if you're, if you're cheerful, praise. Right? That's the other. And so really the Christian life goes like this in the area of a prayer life, is if it's a tough day, pray. If it's a tough moment, pray. If it's a good moment, thank you, God. Right? Simple enough, right? Do this. Having a bad morning, pray. Having a good afternoon, praise. And really, the Christian's prayer life should vacillate between prayer and praise. You know, it's been interesting, even in our Wednesday night, um, Wednesday night prayer meeting, whatever we call it, um, that some weeks there's more praising. We've all had better weeks. There's not as many sick people. God has done some really wonderful things. There's good testimonies, and so it's not a prayer meeting, it's a praise meeting. There's nothing wrong with that. Quite frankly, you ought to do both. Uh, it was interesting to me that uh, when Fred and I went to see the Brooklyn Tabernacle prayer meeting, is that there was as much praising as praying. And I think James is saying this should be seen in our prayer life. If you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, praise. Personal prayer life. This is just a rule of thumb. 
But then James moves on and says, okay, we've got this truth for personal prayer life. Let's talk about prayer life in regards to the context of the church, in regards to physical problems. Uh, and the second point is that we should know the place of prayer among the church leadership. What has God given to the church in this area? Uh, and let's look at verse 14 to the, and, and the first part of verse 15. Now notice the word suffering is just generalized suffering. You're having a bad time, right? Just in the last verse. You're suffering, pray. If you're having, if you are cheerful, praise. But now James brings up the topic of physical sickness. I'm ill. I'm in the bed. I have a physical problem. And James says, is anyone among you sick? Uh, he should call for the elders of the church, and they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will uh, raise him up. Now, James now talks about prayer in the context of folks that are sick. Now, again, None of the things that James is talking about is things that we must do in every context, but there are things that we can do and should do in some context. James is putting out general principles. Now notice something, uh, verse 14, is that if anyone is sick, and especially if a person is too sick to pray for themselves, by the way, the idea here is, if you have a cold, pray for yourself, right? Uh, we don't. <laughs> um, but if the level of sickness is getting to a point where you realize you're barely with it, then that's a good time to call for some outside intercession, isn't it? You realize, now, I'm not physically able anymore to, 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 to really call on heaven for my healing here, uh, so I, would, I need some other people to stand in the gap for me. Uh, now you say, now, uh, Rusty, you mean praying and anointing people with oil? Is that anything y'all do at the Baptist church? I'm going to tell you a little story. <laughs> I'll tell you a story. One night, um, I'll tell you a true story. It's one of the few times um, that I really... I really felt like, to be honest with you, I was part of a healing. Rusty. All right? Tell you a true story. Um, it was several years ago. Well, Kent probably knows exactly how many years ago it was. And Teresa was having horrible problems. Teresa ain't got it. And she had gone through one bout of this colon thing and another bout of this colon thing. And then, I don't know, they just kept coming. And, and we thought, I thought, everything was fine. We finally, Teresa was going to leave. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be it. And I was sitting back in my office, and the phone rang, and I heard Mary pick it up, and somebody reported, they got to do more surgery on Teresa. And I just remember sitting at my desk, and and just thinking about this, I remember so vividly. I just remember that all of a sudden it was like the Holy Spirit said, no. I mean, he just said, no. I said, well, what am I going to do about it? You know what I'm saying? But it was just like, no. It's just like, this isn't the right thing. And I just, I just remember going, what? Is and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit bubbled up James chapter 5. If any of you are sick, call for the elders of the church. Anoint with oil, offer the prayer in faith. So anyway, I don't know, I don't know where Melissa was at that weekend, but I ended up in the car with Scott, and we're riding around Lynchburg. Now I'm sorry, I'm a good Southern Baptist. I don't have any anointing oil laying around, okay? Uh, and um, and so Scott and I are riding around Lynchburg, and the Holy Spirit was like, Rusty, you need to get some. Anointing oil. And I'm thinking, where am I going to Kroger? Where am I supposed to get olive oil at? <laughs> and then I remembered, 
a seminary professor who 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 anointed, did this and he said you can buy these little bottles of anointing oil at um, New Life you know the bookstore <clears throat> and so I'm driving home I'm almost too embarrassed to tell Scott what I'm thinking about <laughs> I said, Scott, I got to get some over here at the Christian bookstore. He said, You got to do what? I said, Just pull over, pull over the car, boy. You know, <laughs> he because I hate driving, so if I can get in the car with somebody, I always do. I said, I'll be back in a minute. So I went back there and you know, I walked to the clerk. I said, Y'all got some anointing oil around here? And the lady's like, Yeah, we got some of that stuff in the back. You know, people don't ask for that stuff too often. I said, Well, you know what? Just, 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 just give it to me. You know what I'm saying? And I, I paid for it, and and then I then I hid it. And I sat back down in the car. I said, what'd you get? I said, don't worry about it. Let's just go on out of here. <laughs> I, said, what? I said, Scott, let's just go. And he said, what'd you get? I mean, I saw you at the cash. You bought something. And so I, I, Scott, I get, you anointing people with oil. Who are you anointing with oil? I said, Scott, just let it be, man. Just let it be, you know. Uh, I said, just go home. He said, Rusty Yard? I said, just let it be, all right? I said, it's got to be what it's got to be. And so then, well, breaking into the sky was hard enough. Then I remember that Sunday afternoon, I, had, I, was going, I, was, I pulled all the elders together. I said, now, <clears throat> I know I ain't been to preaching past too long, and I got to get y'all's consensus, but I think we got to go to the hospital and anoint Teresa with oil. They said, you do, uh, okay, <laughs> all right. And, and it was just everybody was stone quiet. It was stone quiet going down the road. You know, we talked a little bit, but they're like, was Rusty lost it? I'm like, what? I just, we're going to do it. And I'll be honest, I was like, I guess this is the right thing to be doing, you know. But I just sensed that this was what, what God wanted. I knew it was in line, it was okay, it was in line with Scripture. <clears throat> so I remember walking into her room, and there was Teresa, and um, Kent was there. And the doctor said, next morning surgery, right? And so I pulled out James chapter 5, and I said, Teresa, we're here in obedience to scripture and it says if anyone's sick he's called the elders of the church and they're to pray and to anoint anoint you with oil so I took my little bottle of oil and I put a dab right there on the forehead and we just went around the room and prayed and honestly to goodness it was like for you know the Holy Spirit of God came in and just said I've dealt with this. And I remember when, when I left, Kent was kind of like shaking my hand like this, you know? <laughs> like, you know, like, I mean, it was just like, what, it's something happening, you know? And so we just like, whoop, well, you know, I'm like, so we got back in the van, we're like, well, that was weird. And, uh, you know, we did it. And, and, and you know, and we, and we felt so charged up, at least, you know, and we're like, well, we don't want to work somebody up, and, you know, Tell them that they're healed, you know, if they're not healed. So we just, we just prayed, and that was it. Next day, doctor said, no problems. She went home. And I, and I thought, well, we can't, we, can't, we can't debate that, can't we? And I remember I was going to call the other elders, and they were like, because, man, we had really put ourselves out there. You know, I mean, we had really done it. Um, but, I mean, and, um, you know, I've the other, other, you know, the reason I was reminded of this, the other Wednesday night in prayer meeting, you can't brought this up. I said, boy, this was a, and even from Teresa's vantage point, she sensed that at that moment that God healed her body. And um, but that doesn't happen every day. It's not something we're doing every day. Um, but I don't want to tell you this, but I am going to tell you this, and I don't know why I got this, but I got an uncanny sense if you're going to live or die most of the time. I don't want to tell you that. You know what I'm saying? But, I mean, it's almost like if I come to sometimes the Holy Spirit says, you better have a conversation right now because this person's going out of here in a hurry. I've had that same sense. Like, you better get down and talk to them about the gospel because they're, they're going out of here now. And then a few other times, God says, don't worry about it. They're fine. And uh, that was one of the clear times where I stuck my neck out and uh, God decided to stick his neck out too. And uh, praise God. There's nothing wrong for praying for healing, by the way. 
And there's nothing wrong when you get so broken down and this is to call for the elders of the church. You know, finally, we have elders, so you can actually call for them. Isn't that nice? Uh, you know, before we call for the elders of the church, we didn't have any. Uh, you know, but uh, now we've got them. they got the right labels and everything, so you can call for them. And by the way, if you sense, because the initiative is really to be you, if you feel like you're so sick and God lays it on your heart to call for us, we're available to be called on. And so if you're down and out and you think Jesus is calling and you don't want to answer, give us a call. We're not going to promise anything, but we'll do our part, right? You see? And um, it's, um, you know what? You may just be that person. That sickness may be the trophy of God's grace to let you know that he is real and there for you. Well, I don't want to stay there too long. I want to get to our third point. And this is where James really shocks us because he's talking about prayer and then he tells us in the context of sickness, we should know the possible connection. And please, notice the word, say it aloud, possible. Okay, Possible, thank you. Connection of personal sin and sickness. Now clearly in the Gospels, the old method was that if you were sick you had committed sin right that was and that jesus corrected that teaching you know what the the there's a episode in the gospel that won't come to my mind now but there was a person who was sick and they said who is who did wrong you know and jesus said well nobody did wrong he's just sick so that the son of man may be glorified in this healing right but just because by the way that every sickness is not related to sin some sickness is related to sin. And so we might have overcorrected so far that we forget even about this possibility. Okay, so hear me carefully. Not all sickness is in response to sin. It might just be in response to old age. But the Bible is also clear that some sickness is responsible for sin. Some sickness is because of personal sin. The Apostle Paul is so strong in this area, he says that some people have actually died because they partook of the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. Paul says some of you who've come to the Lord's table loaded up in sin and have partaken of the table without examination, he says many of you are sick and some are asleep because of this. So it's, it's something that we ought to at least keep our our eyeballs open for. Look what James says. In the context of the elders praying for the one who is sick, notice the word, what? If, right? If. It says, and if he has committed sins, that obviously has brought upon sickness, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. You know, one of the things that we should do when we are sick is we should think. Now, you know, I, I want to be so careful here because sometimes sickness just happens. It just happens, okay? We live in a fallen world and none of us are going to get out of here alive unless Jesus comes, right? Right? But the Bible says that some sickness, some, is related to sin. And God uses sickness and other things to get our attention over a sin problem. Um, and yet in the context of physical struggles, James says, not, don't just let the elders pray for you, but this is the appropriate time for what? I'm saying, well, like confession. And so it wouldn't be bad right in this moment. I'm sick. And God has laid it upon my heart that one of the reasons I'm here is because of this. I can say, I don't like to give away confidences, but in the last six months, I am very confident that I have run into two people to whom were sick physically sick, came to talk to me, loaded up on 
meds. We talked over some time. Stuff came up and out. And then the week after we talked, and there was confession, guess how much pain they had? Zero. So my, you know, my counselor had over here says, oh, they had somatoform disorder and we talked it out. But maybe they had a sin problem that got confessed out and God says, lesson learned. We will alleviate the pain. And so, I mean, just an experience, two in six months. And James is saying, by the way, don't we know this? If your soul gets all out of line, your body kind of gets all out of line with it. What do you think? You ever seen somebody who lived a hard life? They probably did the same thing you did. You know. But their soul sickness has created body sickness. And so the whole idea of confession and healing is real, very real. And James just says, be aware of it. Not all sickness is in regard to sin. But some is. And if God reveals that to you in the time of sickness, good time for confession. And it says, in the confession you will be forgiven. And then the text ends. So we see prayer in our personal life, prayer among church leadership and sickness, the issue of confession to one another in regard to sickness and personal sin. But the bottom line is, in the, in, to keep our faith up and, up and active, we should believe in earnest prayer. And I'm going to move through this re reasonably rapidly. Our time's up. Verse 17 says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Meaning Elijah wasn't nobody special. Yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the land. And then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth, and someone turns them back, he should know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. I want to just show you how this book of James ends. James ends with the image of Elijah. The Elijah who was just a normal man but did extraordinary things because he believed in earnest prayer. He just got with it. He just did it. And as, he, as Elijah learned to pray, God moved in a big way. But notice how James ends because earnest prayer changes things. And the biggest thing it changes is it changes lives. Because verse 19 and 20 says, and by the way, the book does not end talking about someone converting. Verse 19 says, My brothers, if any, of, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, he should know that that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. The issue here is that you know one of the ways that not only we keep ourselves afloat, but help keep other people afloat is by learning to pray and be there for people in the area of confession. You know, James says if you can be the person who earnestly prays for people and the person who earnestly deals with people and confession happens, he says you'll save a soul from death and you'll cover a multitude of sins. You know what's so wonderful about intercessory prayer? Is that it changes the course of people's lives. It calls on the host of heaven to intercede in the affairs of men to cut people off at the pass, to save the soul from death and to cover a multitude of sins. And I think about faithful people who have prayed and persisted for another person. And how many times did God dispatch his angels to just stop disaster? 
We won't know this until heaven, right? All that has happened. But this is, this is listen, if we, we believe in earnest and honest prayer, it says that we will really cut people off at the past. God will, we will call on heaven. He'll de deploy, deploy people to earth to make something happen in a big way. And so if we want to keep our faith up, up and active, we have to pray earnestly. The, the final plea is, let's just do it. By the way, we offer opportunities for this. It's something that needs to be done personally, but I think you need to find a time of accountability to do this with one another. Because prayer is not just to God, but real prayer, effective prayer, also has a component of confession to men, by the way. And this, this two-way conversation is important, and you need to be doing it somewhere. By the way, if you're not a Christian, you heard Don's great testimony about a person today who says, God, I don't, I don't know Jesus. And maybe you heard that testimony tonight. You said, I'm just like that lady Don talked, to, talked with in the car tonight. You know what? I'm available. Don's available. Plenty of other people are available. Just come today, tonight and say, look, I'm not a Christian. I need to be saved. Well, the altar's always open here for that. For you Christians here tonight, let's just think about this area of prayer and let's just do it. Not just learn about it, but make it happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask you that you would make us more earnest in this area. God, for the people tonight that are suffering, God, may they not complain or doubt. God, may they pray. God, for the people tonight that are having good times, God, may they praise you and thank you for the graciousness that you have provided in their life. God, for the ones tonight that are sick, God, if you so desire that they need intercession from the elders of this church, God, may they even now be so moved in their spirit to call for us. God, may we be willing to go. God, we pray for the people that are broken down physically because they are broken down spiritually in sin. God, may you heal their soul and their body as they confess. And God, may it be because of the earnest prayer of this place that many souls are saved from death and multitudes of sin are erased. God, may we be an Abraham who prays for a lot. God, who spares them. God, help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand again. Oh